O God, who by the passion of Christ, your Son, our Lord, abolished the death inherited from ancient sin by every succeeding generation, grant that just as being conformed to him, we have borne by the law of nature the image of the man of earth, so by the sanctification of grace we may bear the image of the man of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would have believed what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought him of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked, and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days, through his suffering, my servant, though through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. For all my foes I am an object of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. Those who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. 
A reading from the book of Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden, into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am, so if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said, I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into his cabri. Shall I not bring the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guard seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold, and they were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples 
and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in a temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone, in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants will, will be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, So then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, king of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him, do you not speak to me? 
Do you not know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You will not, you will have no power over me if I had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate re tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone, stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear, tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be, in order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I test. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over his spirit. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. 
and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with the burial cloths along with the spices according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. You know, every Easter triduum that we celebrate, I become very expectant for Saturday afternoon when a number of people will come looking for their Saturday Vigil Mass. And I can't help smiling because, of course, somehow they miss the drama of the week, the celebration of the gift of the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood on Holy Thursday and the passion of jet and death and the veneration uh, of, the, of Jesus and the veneration of the cross and and somehow we're not aware of the fact that um, on Holy Saturday we celebrate uh, essentially Jesus' descent into the dead, into hell, where he freed all the holy souls. So there is no Mass. There is no Mass on Good Friday. There is no Mass on Holy Saturday until the beginning of our Easter celebration which happens on the night of Holy Saturday. I think it's wonderful that they have that habit of going to Mass Sunday in and Sunday out, but this Triduum and Good Friday when we don't have Mass and Holy Saturday when we don't have Mass uh, kind of shake us out of our complacency. They kind of shake us out of our, our normal routine. Uh, because they make us think about the most grave events when the Savior of all the world was taken from us, when he was taken to that place that was most distant from us, that place where we would not wish to go. Um, and when we were deprived of the one who came to teach us about God as Heavenly Father and about the coming of the kingdom and who was going to show us the way to salvation. Of course, for us, that's short-lived because we know that just a few hours away we're going to celebrate the, the, uh, the feast of the resurrection of our Lord, which is the, great, the greatest news that the world has ever heard, uh, the greatest news that was ever proclaimed to every father and mother of a child and every, uh, every brother and sister of every friend, that the loves that they have are meant to be forever in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So on this most unusual triduum, when we are deprived of the Mass, we are, in a sense, deprived of Jesus in the Eucharist. But in truth, we're not deprived of Jesus, are we? We know that we have communion with him through the sacraments which he celebrated, through baptism, which unites us to his mystical body and unites us to one another. So we are not alone. He is always with us. And we know, we expect, we pray that this pandemic, this coronavirus, will be over shortly and we'll be able to gather together once again to worship uh, him and receive him in holy communion. And in the meantime, though, deprived of this Eucharistic presence, we nevertheless do what? We pray to him, we ask him for spiritual communion, and we pray for one another, and especially for all of our brothers and sisters in the parish and around the world who are suffering from this uh, coronavirus, this terrible sickness. You know, I thought a lot this Holy Week about a Jesuit priest, uh, who is now deceased, his name was Walter Chiswick. He had written a book, uh, He Leadeth Me, and With God in Russia. 
At the beginning of the war, he had been in Poland, uh, though he was an American, to minister to Russians, to be kind of a missionary. And uh, when he traveled to Russia with the Poles who were going there for work, he was arrested by the KGB and jailed, put into the Lubyanka, which is the infamous prison there, and questioned as a Vatican spy. He had, through all that time, been deprived of mass and his faith was sorely tested, but through it all he had, well, prayed for that communion with Jesus that he would have as if the mass were being celebrated, as if he would be receiving Holy Communion. And that sustained him, that kept his faith alive. And when he was finally exiled to, the, to Siberia, to the Gulag Archipelago, he had, he had um, uh, uh, when he had finally been exiled there, he found some moments in which he obtained bread and wine and could actually celebrate the Mass and be a missionary to the other prisoners there and give them Holy Communion, although this was rare. He was later eventually uh, released um, in a trade with the, uh, between the Americans and the Russians for, uh, for spies. And he returned home where he had lived here in New York at the Jesuit community in Fordham. Um, and he could be a saint. Um, but what he taught us, I think, what he taught me is this, well, this importance of, you know, that actually our physical commun communion with Jesus in the Eucharist should always lead us to a spiritual communion. And I think that's what our, this occasion that we're, this present moment is uh, suggesting to us that, God is leading us to a spiritual communion with Jesus. So as we unite ourselves with him in our prayer, um, we should make that communion real, as if he were sitting next to us, as if we were sitting with him, with his Father in heaven, as if we are as close to him as close can be, because in reality he is. He is with us, and especially in this time in this moment, we should never forget that. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, Watch over the works of your mercy that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Pope, let us pray also for our Most Holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and on hand for the Lord's Holy Church, to govern the holy people of God. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on, your, on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For all in holy orders and degrees of the faithful, let us pray also for our Bishop Timothy, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people.
Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the unity of Christians, let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism is consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Jewish people, let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and his faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also, also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love, and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For the afflicted in time of this pandemic, let us pray also, also for all those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic, that God the Father may grant help to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to families, and salvation to all the victims who have died. Almighty, ever-living God, only support of our human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick, give strength to those who care for them, welcome into your peace those who have died, and throughout this time of tribulation, grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Now I invite everyone at home to perhaps take a crucifix from your walls or from your rosaries or wherever, and we'll just take a moment now to venerate the cross as we might have if we were celebrating together in this liturgy. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy be for me protection in mind and body, and a healing remedy. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter into my room, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people, who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.